Howdy all of you delicious people, I'm here today to review Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So going into this film, I think immediately a lot of people will say, yeah, this movie isn't as good as the first one, or uh, they won't like the story as well as the first one. Like, I can say yeah, but I think there's also some really cool visuals that they go on and they give us. There's certain characters that probably people won't even realize are even in this film because they're CGI-like characters. Like, uh, immediately I'll come up with Michael Rosenbaum, who I've seen on the uh, one YouTube channel, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. And uh, if you don't know who Michael Rosenbaum is, because maybe you need a refresher, if anybody has ever gone on and seen the Superman show Smallville, we, of course, have Michael Rosenbaum being the Lex Luthor um, of that show. Or also, we have him being in the first Urban Legends movie, if, if people have seen that also. Um, he actually plays a character that, of course, is to be CGI'd in this film. And hopefully I'll be able to say the name of that character once we get there. Because I probably will butcher it, and I apologize. Uh, there might be one time towards the end here where I might have to take a second to go on and uh, switch to a certain part of something because I goofily uh, did something incorrect. So I'll have to make sure that once we get to that part. Uh, so once we get into spoilers. So I think the relief part about this show or about this movie, I mean, is that it feels like there isn't a massive amount of things that I need to learn and understand throughout this whole entire thing. I love that. <laughs> I don't have to go to like an Infinity War kind of level. Or I don't have to go through Endgame and have to know 50 different places that all these people are traveling within one film. Thank God for that. Um, I love the fact that we don't have this be like a Dark Knight kind of situation where there's so many vicious cuts and it's all over the gosh darn place. And I'm just like, oh my god, where am I? Who am I? Why am I? <laughs> because, like, there's a lot of times where I feel like I will mess things up a lot more. So, hopefully I don't mess up most of this movie and I can get it right when it goes down to spoilers. Because, uh, this is also a big movie and it's a very interesting film. Um, but it's really nice that we're still continuing to use characters, uh, if you want to talk about CGI, uh, it's good that we're continuing to use characters like Howard the Duck. Um, I would like for them, because it was kind of interesting, because Kevin Smith, uh, was to have gone on and said that he was going and trying to get off the ground a Howard the Duck series, but that just went nowhere. I'm like, man... I would honestly like them to use Howard the Duck and do something with that. Uh, they went on and used him in What If, but I'm like, is that it? Is that all we're going to do with this character? Just because I would like, if you're going to make a mini series, like especially if it's animated, you might as well just make Howard the Duck series. Uh, you might as well. Um, for how often we've used this character, how often we've had this character, uh go and make an animated series of Howard the Duck and just slap it on Hulu uh, if you're not going to do it on Disney+. Plus. Because I feel like they've gone undone some really interesting things with Hulu, uh, like Hitmonkey or... Uh, God, what was the other one? Uh, Modoc? Those things were kind of interesting. I watched uh, the beginning of Hitmonkey and so, so on and so forth. But back on to Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2. <laughs> At least, thank God, this movie doesn't have a long stretch of a sequel name and whatever. It's just simply Volume 2. And hopefully the sequel doesn't have an overstretched, long stretch of a name. Uh, that, of course, is like, oh, it's Guardians of the Galaxy, the escape of <laughs> of Warlock. <laughs> like, or some goofy thing like that. Of like, hopefully it's just called Volume 3. Because I think that should just be simple enough. Because Guardians of the Galaxy is a mouthful anyways. And so why would you go on and have it be the Guardians of the Galaxy, the longest stretching title name that you can ever, ever imagine in your life? Blah, 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 blah. No. Um, so yeah, like the dream casting upon this movie uh, was really interesting. Uh, we had uh, 
and I know I'll, I'll eventually show this guy's name, uh, uh, his actual name when I talk about him. Um, I was so excited uh, that I went on, and I'm a big fan of this show called, uh, like, I say big fan, but I've seen the show. Uh, I like the show. I'm in, I, uh, Farscape. The guy who plays Crichton on Farscape is in this, uh, is in this, this movie. And I was like, oh my God. Hmm. Like, I thought that that was so great because I was a Farscape fan and I saw him in this movie. I'm like, oh my God, that's Crichton, basically. Uh, I know, I believe his name is Ben, uh, but when we get through uh, parts of here, I'll uh, I'll get to the actual names. But I'm like, oh my God, that's the guy from Farscape. And he's freaking uh, with the, um, the uh, he's with the, the gold girls or the, the gold people. And I'll, I'll get to the actual names of that. The, the sovereign people. There we go. Um, I kind of, I kind of th would have thought that these guys would have actually had much more to them as far as like they had this like long stretch of an alien name or whatever. But no, like it just seems like they're called sovereign people and that's it. So I'm like, OK, that's, that's good enough for me, I guess. So teeing it up, what is this movie about? Because maybe at some day you probably never saw What If or you didn't go on to see a number of things. Uh, as far as MCU, what would I say at the end of the day would be Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2? Well, it's a simple story. If the first one, of course, was about uh, Peter Quill losing a mother, uh, in this sequel story, he is, he is to gain a father. And he is to go on and meet a, uh, a man named Ego, who is to be a living planet that is to have the ability to separate himself from his living planet, which is goofy, but it doesn't make sense. And here's also the thing. So Ego's ship that he is to go and uh, fly off with, it seems like Ego's ship doesn't have a name, which kind of sucked. Because <laughs> I was looking and trying to research to see if, like, Ego's ship had an actual name. It's like, no, it's just Ego's ship. Nah, <laughs> So we have these huge, elaborate, goofy names for everything else. Numer numbers of characters and so on and so forth. But Ego Ship is just like, nah, it's Ego Ship. They could have just called it the Egg. Um, they, j they, could have just, they could have just called it the EG. They could have just called it the Egg. And maybe the reason why like they call it that is because like Ego wanted like an even shorter name. And so he's like, Egg, nah. E.G. So, I don't know. But it is what it is. So, really that's all that you probably really need to know. Uh, we, of course, have some dissension in the ranks between the Ravengers. And the Ravengers are going to be a, a way more important part in this movie than, uh, of course, in the first film. We're going to see a lot of them uh, compared to the first one, which I do enjoy. Because I guess since we don't have the Nova Corps, because the Nova Corps had gotten wiped out one way or the other, uh, we go on and we have uh, the Ravengers being a much more vital part upon this story. So, uh, so yeah, I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, for a lot of people, they're probably like, dude, we, we know Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. We just want to hear eventually if you'll F up when you get to the spoilers. Because that's bound to happen. <laughs> that's it, You might as well get ready for when I F up. Because if I don't F up, that'll be surprising. So uh, so let's go out of our way to say that it's about that time to just go into spoilers to talk about this film. Let me know in the comments below how you feel about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. And whatever have you. Uh, let me know if you are to be interested in talking about Guardians of the Galaxy the first one. Or Endgame, now that these all are technically to be all reviewed by me and whatever, even though I've seen them a number of times anyways. Uh, let me know in the comments below about any MCU movie, even if it's something that I haven't covered. Maybe you're going to talk about Morbius or, or Morbius. Uh, 
Yeah, Morbius. <laughs> I was like, am I saying that right? Because Morpheus is uh, the, the Matrix character, uh, and I always get those confused, as well as anybody. So, uh, so with that said, let's just go into that double five. Let's go into that time, because it's about that time to just go into spoiler time. Spoiler time, it's about that time we're going to do spoil this movie. Really, I honestly have Disney Plus, so that's where I went and I saw it and I watched it and I was like, hmm, what a film. Um, overall, my grading for this movie, uh, I I like this movie as a visually uh, impressive thing. I don't remember what I graded the first Guardians of the Galaxy, but whatever possibly grade that was to have there... I feel almost as equally the same with this film. Just because of its a visual approach, uh, there is a lot of real heart in this story. Uh, if someone is to tell you that they don't use their head, they use their heart uh, within this story. Um, so I would, I would probably have to say that, yeah, this is not as good as the first movie, but there is just... Like, this has to be a somewhere ball parking me of still a great film. A great to whatever Guardians of the Galaxy first uh, review that I did, because I don't remember the grading system because I didn't go and go through that uh, review. Um, if I said epic, then this would have to be great uh, for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. I think that probably has to be epic because it, it's like a big massive star wars thing and i remember saying that it's like oh my god this is a big huge massive star wars battle of a thing and it's so complex and complicated oh my god it's so epic it's so this so this has to be like a great movie that has some interesting elements into it so let's go out of our way to say like let's just go into spoiler time spoiler time it's about that time i get to spoil this movie so the beginning of this film we of course are to start off uh, in Missouri, uh, Earth. <laughs> Everybody has complaints about that, where it's like, oh, they had to tell us it was on Earth? You know what? Some people could have probably thought that this was planet Missouri, and they would have got confused. Give them a break. So, this is Missouri on Earth, 1980. So, we go on, and we have both... Uh, Ego and uh, Meredith, who are going and driving on, and it seems that, uh, of course, Meredith, this was her, uh, that whole uh, Brandy song was, of course, to be her favorite song, and so I guess she was singing along to it, but it seems that Meredith is to know every single song that is to be popping on on the radio, so... We go on and have both Ego and Meredith, who are driving along, uh, to go into some uh, forest somewhere. Where we go on and, of course, have uh, Ego showing Meredith uh, this thing called The Expanse. Because really all that that's really called is just The Expanse. I couldn't find anything of individual thing about these little things that are put onto these planets and what exactly they're called. It, it, for any research that I was going in to do, it was just The Expanse. So I was like, okay, so I won't go any further on that. And if there is something that I missed, then it is what it is. I'm not going to go on and correct anything because I'm not going to go into that further amount of research. So... Now that we end up seeing that uh, from behind a Dairy Queen, nonetheless, what kind of garbage sponsorship is going on into this superhero-like film? Come on! They couldn't have gone on and just, like, not have a sponsored thing? I don't care. It's okay. Uh, when looking at it at the end of the day, I don't know how many superhero movies have way too much sponsorship in their films. Whereas this one, it just feels like convenient and if you're gonna go and uh have a sponsorship it it would have to be dairy queen uh like that that is a really good choice for this film so we go on and now we have to fast forward to 34 years later so uh and i don't know why that photo is there <laughs> okay um so fast forward to the sovereign 
And so, and this is 34 years later. So it seems that we have a very old fashioned uh, football uh, game that uh, Quill is reusing for some kind of, uh, I want to say it was a scanner. Uh, I don't know. I'm not knowing for sure. So we go on and we have, of course, them being in Sovereign having to go and protect these big, massive batteries because I guess uh, the Sovereign people are to really heavily rely on these kind of uh, these really well put together batteries for some odd reason. So we go on and we have, of course, these arrow rigs that are uh, being placed onto most of the Guardians. And we are going and realizing that Drax is... Why, Drax, why don't you have the arrow rigs? And we go on and we have Drax who's mentioning that his nipples are sensitive. Where are the nipples upon this man, I ask you? But <laughs> uh, his nipples are sensitive. So by golly, just let him be, I guess. So... We go on and we, of course, have Groot at some point, Baby Groot, who is attacking an Or, um, or, or Loney. And uh, as the music is playing at the uh, early stages of this, but I'm, I'm, we'll get there in a second. It seems like these things are used quite often. And it seems like we have them being used in the Ravenger ship. And these things are also to be used in Endgame when, of course, uh, War Machine and Nebula go off to uh, see Quill. And uh, and eventually you'll hear me say that when I go and talk about uh, Endgame. You can go and, and hear that. Uh, I think that these things are also used in the first Guardians. Maybe when they're playing that one game uh, where Rocket and... Drax are going on and like betting on these things. Uh, so anyways, we go on and we all of a sudden have a, uh, have the, uh, Abelisk who is to arrive upon the sovereign place and is going on and attacking the guardians of the galaxy because I'm not seeing exactly what this monster is to go on and need any of these batteries for because it's not really confirmed within this film. Uh, we don't see at some point where uh, this obelisk is going on and trying to like uh, consume them or anything. So we go on and we find out that this monster seemingly has some kind of impenetrable skin, but weirdly we have some kind of uh, nick upon his, uh, upon his neck or upon his uh, chin. So we of course go on and we have Rocket who is to try and uh, put together some kind of sound system for them, for them to have music while they're fighting. And before the obelisk drops like it's hot. So we have the guardians that are telling Rocket like, hey, like, you shouldn't probably be wasting your time on putting a sound system on. And Rocket is like, and Quill, you're thinking that too? And he's like, yeah, I think it is a waste. And then Rocket's like, uh-huh, Quill. Yeah, sure. Yeah, wink. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, like, you're telling me that. And so Peter's like, no, I think you're really wasting your time. And he's like, ah, okay, sure. <laughs> so we go on and we have them starting to fight this obelisk. And so... We go on and we have Baby Groot who is to put together the sound system and is starting to dance, um, of course, this one song, which I don't know what it actually is. Let me know in the comments below what the song of this song is so that way I can get a comment because I'd appreciate it. So every time that I'm supposed to mention some song and I don't remember the song thing to it, just let me know in the comments below whatever it is because I'm sure I'm going to forget it. So... All of a sudden, we have the Guardians who's fighting the Basilisk, or the Basilisk, the Albalisk, um, 
And so we have Groot dancing in the background. At one point, he's going and trying to eat a bug, and Rocket is to try to spit it out of him and like smack it out of him to be like, "Hey, like take get that bug out. That's disgusting." So we go on, and at one point, R two have Drax that is to jump inside of this monster because I guess he figures if he can't penetrate this monster from the outside, you might as well try to uh, uh, kill it on the inside. And we, we just see Trax, who's just taking his daggers, and he's like, ah, la, 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 la. <laughs> It looks freaking hilarious. The best thing about this movie honestly has to be, hands down, Dave Bautista. Hands, this is the funniest part about this character, is really just Trax. And, like, thank God that James Gunn was to have so much faith in uh in dave to have him go on and do uh these films because man like we have drax that is just such an interesting character and we just thoroughly enjoy him through every one of these films and it's sad to possibly hear that the third film may be eventually dave's last approach to this character um so that just is kind of sad so, we go on and we, of course, have it where uh, Gamora is to have Peter go and say to her, it's like, well, aren't you the sword girl? <laughs> aren't you the sword person? And Gamora's like, well, hey, like, we have a big, huge monster and I'm going to use a sword against it? Like, no. But... Come to find out, Gamora uses a reason for this sword by going and stabbing this thing into uh, into its uh, neck area or its hole like area and slicing through it and coincidentally an unpenetrable skin part of this thing. But once I guess you get some kind of nick in it, you can go and easily slice it down. All of a sudden, having. Drax, who is trying to take the credit for killing this monster, but it's actually technically Gamora. Um, but we can just have supposedly Drax just get the assist, assist on this bad boy. So we go on here and we have Alicia, who is to be the sovereign queen, I'm assessing or assuming. So we have Alicia that's going on and ushering in the Guardians and... Thanking them, of course, for uh, killing this monstrous being and protecting their batteries as we go on and we have Groot who is to steal some. So we go on and we have Alicia who has a lot of freaking lines to just deliver here where she's going on and talking about how uh, like she doesn't want to sacrifice her own sovereign people, but it also seems that uh, the sovereign people can just turn around and make more of uh, the sovereign people like crazy like this because they have a different way of going and doing uh, like sovereign people birthing compared to uh, compared to normal like reproductive like ways. Uh, and so we have a one point where Peter is talking to Alicia and saying, it's like, well, hey, maybe I'll show you how to do it the old fashioned way. And Alicia's like, hmm, I'd probably like that because it seems that Alicia is to find out that Quill is to have some kind of interesting lineage about his ancestry or or whatever, because Gwen Close was to tell him upon the first movie about that. And so... We, of course, have Alicia asking Quill, it's like, well, where are your parents from? And, of course, Quill is saying, it's like, well, my uh, mother's from Missouri. And, she, and she's like, okay, what about your father? And he's like, well, not from Missouri, but I don't know where he's from. So we go on here and we, of course, have it where... Uh, the price for them going on and saving these sovereign people is for the sovereign people to have nebula and they're like okay great 
Like, we can go and we can take Nebula and we can trade her in uh, to be imprisoned at Xandar and we can collect the bounty on her, so that'll be great. As all the Guardians are walking off here, we go on and we, of course, have Rocket, who's showing Drax these uh, Enumalex batteries. Sure. <laughs> we have them pronounce this a number of times, and Drax is to always call it something different. It's like, like the, he ends up calling it some goofy harlot something or other goofy thing. And I'm like, what the f- <laughs> Huh? But he keeps pronouncing it that way. So, we go on and have the Guardians who go off, and it seems that everything is going well. And so, I think this is roughly round, around the part where we, of course, have Peter, uh, who is consistently trying to woo over Gamora, uh, but it just seems like it will never really happen, to where uh, we have both Peter and Gamora, who kind of have this, what they think is alone time, for all of a sudden to have Gamora walk off and all of a sudden Drax is just to appear like that. And so we, of course, have like Quill who just kind of like freaks out because like, oh, my God, Drax, you're there. So Drax goes on and says, like, yeah, like you and Gamora will never work out. Like, uh, like, if anything, you just need someone who's just as pathetic as you are. Like, I remember uh, when I found my uh, my wife, Ovet, and, like, she, uh, like, she never danced. Not to the most rhythmic, melodic thing you could ever imagine. And, like, I was, uh, and, like, a lot of people had probably thought and thought that she was dead. <laughs> and so on and so forth and so we go on we have Drax just having this whole story about Ovet and how he just easily and quickly fell in love with her because of his nethers uh just erupting and so we go on and we have Peter that's like oh, okay I'm gonna leave here um because we of course have it where Drax is mentioning that uh Gamora is never going to be a, a uh, a dancer and Peter will be so like they're just too uh they're just too different they're just too they're not even like uh like I could probably say they're two different sides of the same coin but I don't even feel like that's right so it's kind of funny because we have it where Drax is going on and on about uh how Drax is to find Mantis repulsive. And at one point, I'm thinking, I'm like, wait a minute. I have seen the picture of Ovet and how Drax is saying that he likes a girl with a little bit more meat on his on, on their bones. And I'm like, I'm sorry, if you look at the picture of Ovet and you look at the picture of Mantis, they look the exact freaking same. <laughs> it looks like the exact same character. I don't know what Drax is talking about, but maybe he didn't, like, Google search what Ovet actually looks like. Uh, or maybe there wasn't this image of what Ovet looked like uh, until XYZ past time of whatever. But let's go on here. So, we of course have the Sovereigns that are to now find out that Rocket had stole their batteries. And so, we're going on here and have the Sovereigns that are taking... Uh, of course, these uh, remotely piloted ships that are, of course, to be called the uh, the Sovereign Drone Ships. And we are going on here and having them chasing after, uh, of course, uh, the Milano here. And so we go on, and the funny thing is we have Gamora... When they're starting to shoot down, shoot down these drone trips, drone ships, we of course have it where Gamora is saying, "Hey, we're wasting 
uh, we're wasting our time because we're technically killing nobody because these are remote uh, ships. So, like, we're just having people, like, in these little... Uh, these little things that simulate that they're in these ships, but they're really not. So, we go and we have Ben uh, Prouder, uh, who, of course, is the guy from Farscape, who is, of course, the Sovereign Admiral that is going and talking to, uh, of course, uh, Aisha about what is going on here. So, we go on and further and further have it to where it seems that there is to be one guy left uh, to man and try to take the uh, Guardians out, and it's to be a guy named uh, Silak. Weirdly enough, we have to have it to where it's supposedly one guy, but then also we have it where there's a where there where there's a huge number of ships. There's an entire fleet that at some point we have, of course, Ego that is to take them all out. So we go on here, and so we, of course, have it where Drax is desperately as um, we have both Quill and Rocket who are going through this, like, asteroid-like field, and we have both Rocket and Quill consistently trying to take control here of this ship, and we have it to where, because supposedly they're going back and forth about who is the better uh flyer here and that quill has of course said that he is to have loaned this ship for a number of years so he should be the best to, to pilot it and so we have rocket and quill who's fighting back and forth about this to where rocket is mentioning that he's going to have a turd uh in uh quill's bed at some point uh and it won't actually be rockets it'll actually be drax because drax is known to have a big huge turd uh and so on and so forth and they laugh about it so Drax goes on because they had to seal one part of the ship Drax goes on and is to unseal that sh that part of the ship because he is going to go on and be attached to some spool and is to uh go on and have this uh this kind of shield putting being put over his body uh by the tail end of this movie i'll go on and have the correct name for that but we'll we'll get to that later so drax is to go on and is to put this uh shield over his body to be able to uh go out there and have this gun to take down this one last ship and so we go on and we now have it where of course uh, it seems that the Milano is going to have to crash land uh, upon one place. And so we go on and find that that place is Burhart. Burhart. So we go on and we, of course, have uh, them crashing there. And so we have Gamora, who's realizing that Drax is still being hung out to dry outside the ship. So Gamora is going out there to see where Drax really is, and she catches this just in time to grab onto this spool to continue to grab onto Drax. And I was like, just let him go, because he's smacking into anything and, and whatever anyways, so what's the difference uh with holding on to him or not plus also you're probably going to injure yourself trying to hold on to him anyways so plus it really makes no sense that gamora has this amount of strength upon her like i'm just thinking like species wise like she would have this kind of strength to hold on to drax and this spool and uh, but i but that's just me so after the Milano is to, of course, crash land here, we go on and we now have it where Ego ship is also going to land on here. And we go on, we have Rocket, who is mentioning how uh, there was a guy about an inch tall that was to save them. And so we go on and we have Drax, who's thinking, hopefully it's the one inch man. 
as this ship, of course, is to land, which is Ego's ship. And so now we, of course, have uh, Ego realizing that, like, after all this time, after all these years, he's to finally reunite with uh, with Peter. And so I guess because the main reason why and a lot of people could have a complaint about this is like, why didn't Ego go back to planet Earth to go and retrieve this kid himself? Why let Yandu go on and retrieve this kid and have him consistently complain over and over again? about this kid uh, possibly being so tempting to just get eaten, and so on and so forth. Well, Ego is to mention here that he could not go back to Earth a fourth time, or he really could not go to an Earth where Meredith was dead, because Ego was to immediately know that Meredith was going to die, so he thought that this was going to be a pointless thing, to go back to this earth because he could just have someone else be sending uh, Peter back to him uh, and Yandu never did because Yandu was to go on and retrieve a number of kids so on and so forth this is a long stretch process to talk about so We so we transition here and we're having Peter who's meeting with his dad. So we're now transitioning on here with uh, a party at uh, Contraxia. And also, let me pause here for just a simple break. And now we're back. So we're on Contraxia. So the first thing that we're early to see is, of course, Howard the Duck, who's going on and talking to his date. But I guess he is to say, it's like, hey, you're out of luck if you don't go duck. <laughs> Something along those lines. So we, of course, go on and see a number of characters upon this film. Uh, we, of course, go on and are to see uh, Martinex, uh, which, of course, is Michael Rosenbaum, which... Uh, we end up seeing him in both the, uh, both here, more prominent here, but we also see him towards the ending, uh, where we eventually have the Ravengers all collect together, and we end up seeing a number of different Ravengers, which I think at one point, we have possibly one of the voices, I think, for the tail end of this movie, and I could be wrong about this, but I know she's in the movie anyways, as a voice of something. We have uh, Miley Cyrus as a voice for something in this movie. I think we also have uh, Rob Zombie, who is to be like a Ravenger voice that you don't see on screen somewhere. But he's like a voice of somebody. I've seen Rob Zombie also in some other movie where he ends up playing like the voice of some doctor. So it's kind of interesting to see like Rob Zombie technically has some credits of some big lavish films that... Yeah, he only does the voice for him, but, like, I don't know how many people would probably have that same kind of credit. Like, we have uh, Nathan Fillion, who I think was the uh, the little dog, the dog voice for the very first Guardians of the Galaxy film, and, and so on and so forth. So, we also, of course, have Sylvester Stallone as uh, Ogard, and so... We, of course, go on and have uh, Yandu here, who is to, I guess, have finished an activity of being uh, involved with the love bot. And so he goes on and is to leave whatever this establishment was, because I don't actually have the name of here. I just know it's uh, uh, Contraxian uh, or Contraxia. Um Iron Lotus? Iron Lotus. If I'm wrong about that, then my apologies. So, we go on and we have Yandu, who is to all of a sudden bump into Ogard. And so, or Sylvester Stallone's character. So we have this confrontation between these two characters. 
where of course Michael Rosenbaum is kind of looking at him and then he leaves. I'm like, yeah, like it's it's so great to finally go and find out that like Michael was involved in this film because I'm like, oh my God, yeah, like that's so cool that I don't care if it's a CGI credit or whatever, like uh, I don't care that you don't actually see the guys. I don't care. Like freaking like it's amazing to see like certain characters in this film um that you wouldn't have known you wouldn't have known realized were to either lend their voice or to be some kind of character somehow involved in a film so we have ogard telling yondu that he is to uh never get the same treatment as other ravengers because what yondu did with uh kidnapping that uh that young kid because, uh, of course, Ravengers have a code, and when, of course, Yandu is to die, he will never hear the Horns of Freedom, he will never uh, get uh, the same Ravenger treatment when he is to go on and die as a normal Ravenger, and so on and so forth. And so, we go on and we have them go and talk and so Yandu is saying, it's like, well, hey, I wear the same, uh, I wear the same colors you do. I wear the same badge you do. And for Ogard, that, of course, is not enough. It's like, just because you wear the clothes doesn't mean anything. Uh, so we also have it where kind of Taserface and some other guys are just kind of like, yeah, like, uh, like we're really looking at this guy. And it doesn't seem like he's playing for our, our side, our team, or whatever. And we're slowly but surely going to start to find that there is going to be mutiny afoot the more and more that we just have it where Yandu is trying to more and more figure out a way to uh, like help out the Guardians instead of helping them, or hurting them, or arresting them, or taking care of them by possibly killing them because that's just not what Yandu wants to do because he just wants to continue to help them in some other way or another. So we go on and we have Aisha who is to show up uh, as she's basically being uh, having this huge long stretch of a uh, fabric that of course is to be uh, following in front of her for every single time she is to supposedly walk, all of a sudden the fa the like the fabric that is being rolled out is to accidentally stop at one point. And here's the goofy thing: so this thing stops perfectly to where Yandu is, and so we of course have Aisha that is to go on and talk to Yandu and say that she has a. Uh, she has a, uh, a contract for Yandu to go and take on. So, and of course we have Aisha who's talking about the Guardians. She wants to go and have them be killed or have them be taken or have them are just really just getting her batteries back is her main concern, her main jazz. So... We go on to, uh... We go back to Burkhard, or Burkhard, 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 yeah. So, we of course now have Ego that's trying to convince, uh, of course, Peter about the story about, uh, about him going and contracting Yondu to go back to Earth to retrieve Peter, and for some reason he never did. And so Peter was mentioning that, yeah, the only reason why Yandu kept him is because he was small, and I guess it's good for thieving. And there have been a number of times where Yandu would threaten to eat Peter, and we of course have uh, Ego's character that's like, that son of a... So... We go on here and we have Peter 
that's having his dad say it's like well hey like i can go and take you to my planet and i can have you learn uh some things there and we of course have peter is like you know what like this seems all too good to be true and he walks off but gamora really the person that is to want to accept this because she'd be like this seems illogical kind of thing uh it seems like kind of polar opposites here from who these characters are normally uh, to be because we have usually Peter who likes to be the naive like person and so we go on and we have Gamora who's actually convincing Peter to go on and meet uh, and go on and do whatever Ego is to say here because maybe I think uh, maybe for Gamora she could probably go on and say it's like well hey like all you have is possibly this guy. And so, like, Gamora is to realize that Peter already has a family with these guardians. But, like, I think also Gamora is realizing that Peter will question this forever if he doesn't, like, go with this guy. That he'll question, like, man, should I have gone? Because she knows Peter, and she knows that he will, like, hold on to this forever. And so that's, I think, the main reason why Gamora is saying for Peter to go on here. So we go on, and we have Rocket, who's staying behind at Burkhart, uh, at Burkhart to go and fix uh the milano and just spraying it down is all of a sudden getting these nanites that i guess are fixing the ship uh i'm assuming it's nanites i don't know what the technology really is here uh but i'm i'm hoping it's nanites because i would assume that like this is kind of like uh iron man um where it's kind of like the same kind of technology so let me know in the comments below what exactly the technology that Rocket is using so I can get more comments on a video. I don't know. So uh, if there's an actual technical thing for all this, I could I could not have bothered with all the stuff that I already have to memorize and learn and whatever. So we still have it where kind of uh, both Rocket and Quill are kind of at odds with one another in this uh, in this movie. So... We go on, and of course, we have Rocket that's kind of giving uh, Peter crap before he is to leave. Uh, and so Peter is just like, God, like, why are you like this? <laughs> and so we go on, and we have Drax who is getting all of his stuff because he doesn't want baby Groot, or he doesn't want Groot messing with any of his things so we go on and we have everybody who goes on and leaves an ego's ship and so we also go on and have at one point that gamora was uh i think when uh they were at that fire that bonfire we had it to where Gamora was mentioning to Quill about that story where I guess he would tell people when he was drunk about that whole thing uh, where he would say that his dad was Knight Rider and that uh, the main reason why people don't get to see him that often is because he's either in Germany or he's shooting the Knight Rider show. And that's who his dad, supposedly to him, was. So, we also have it to where Gamora was, <laughs> was not even remembering, like, what exact thing that, uh, that Peter was even talking about uh, to where he had to re-explain what Knight Rider was. So, we go and we have Peter, who still has the photo to this day of David Hasselhoff. So, we go on, and so, we, 
we have it where uh, now we have to get to know Mantis. So we have the guys that are kind of having this bet going about what Mantis's antennas are. Uh, we, of course, have Drax who's making a bet where the antler or the uh, the antennas are for her to realize if a door is uh, to, of course, be too tall that the uh, antlers are to or that her antennae are to help her to uh, decide to lower her head. And... Quill is thinking that it's anything but what Drax is to say. So we go on and we find out that Mantis's antennas are to help her uh, with emotional things. Which I can see, especially once we get to Endgame, but I can really see how Mantis's power can be well used uh, for future stories. Really, it would be interesting to see how they kind of continue to add this character into every single uh, addition to this. And I would have thought that this girl would have had a very short shelf life, but it seems like she keeps getting used in all these other things. So bravo for that. Um, because I thought, or I would like to think that everybody would have probably thought that this girl would have been used for one movie and one movie only. But it seems like she's continuing to getting used and we'll see eventually if they keep on with this character for whatever reason or they just kind of let the whole entire Guardians of the Galaxy break up possibly because third film would possibly have everybody just say, yeah, I don't want to do these movies anymore. Uh, I don't want to go and be this character anymore and let's go on and do a brand new Guardians of the Galaxy and let's have a number of different people. Uh, who are all to be the next Guardians of the Galaxy. Because that might very well happen. But I'm sure there's quite a few people that are just like, hey man, I can't wait to go and continue to collect these checks and not have to do anything else for films. Man, is that going to be easy. So, but yeah, so we have it where Mantis is going on and saying that she is to have her powers be dealing with emotional things. To where, of course, we go on and have Mantis, who's touching Quill, finding out that uh, Quill is secretly attracted to Gamora. And we, of course, have Drax laughing at Quill because, like, oh my god, she just revealed your deepest, darkest secret. <laughs> and then we, of course, have Mantis, who is to, of course, touch Drax and start laughing also because uh, she is to love his humor. So all of a sudden we have Mantis who is uh, touching Gamora thinking that uh, she's going to get this uh, interesting feeling off of her. And we of course have Gamora that's telling Mantis it's like, hey, if you go on and you touch me, you're going to lose that arm kind of thing. So Mantis is to also say that I guess at some point she was to... Uh, have her powers being used so that way she could help Ego sleep. To where Drax, of course, wants to see if Gamora, or Gamora, uh, Mantis can help Drax sleep. And so she does so here in this film. So, uh, Burhart, my bad, Burhart. So, speaking of Burhart, back with Rocket going and trying to fix more of this ship. Uh, I guess he is to have quickly fixed this ship because now we have him just delivering a number of different Ravenger traps as the Ravengers uh, were to go on and put a tracer on this ship when they were at the war of uh, Xandar. And we have Yandu who tells Rocket this after them battling it out where Rocket is to seemingly be humming away this song, all of a sudden keeping the Ravengers off guard, thinking that Rocket is in this one location, but he isn't. He's going on, on and playing all these traps for these Ravengers to slip and fall and electrocute themselves through. Getting hit by, I guess, a number of darts, which I'm not sure they are to either kill these Ravengers or to tranquilize and knock them out. So... 
we go on, we start to have the Ravagers blast uh, the trees to have uh, Rocket just going from tree to tree to tree to tree. So Rocket continues to use all these traps to electrify and, and hurt all of these Ravagers. Going on and eventually needing to, of course, uh, have to go on to use hand-to-hand -hand combat at some point. Uh, because he starts to run out of traps to take down all these Ravagers, having to beat up some of these Ravagers by hand. So, we go on, we have Yandu who finally meets up with Rocket. And so, we go on and of course we have Yandu who is not wanting to hurt Rocket or really do anything bad here. But he wants to just say, it's like, well, hey, we can go and take these batteries and sell these on our own on the black market for a quarter of a mil. And we have Taser faces like, wait a minute, Yandu. Like, no, like, if anything, like, uh, Alicia wanted us to take this back to her for a million. Like, what are you doing? So all of a sudden we just realize that uh, Nebula here is to step in. And because Nebula is to convince Baby Groot to help her get unlocked from her chains. And so we go on here and have Nebula shoot off uh, Yondu's uh, kind of uh, thing, uh, which will eventually get replaced by a fin. And so Nebula is going on and is to just kind of rattle off some stuff. And it seems like she wants to be a part of the Ravengers and she wants to get a payout as well. And she starts to eat this fruit and she's like, hmm, it's not ripe. Because <laughs> we go on and we have both Drax and Gamora, who of course are to tell Nebula that this uh, fruit that, they're that Nebula wants to get because she's starving isn't ripe. And then when she finally eats into it, she's, she spits it out. She's like, it's not bright. I'm like, dude, if you're hungry, if you're saying that you're starving, but then you turn around and you're just like, no, it's not good enough. <laughs> this woman is starving. So we go on. And so back to the living planet, the ego, you know, that place. We go on and we, of course, have it where uh, Ego is now explaining uh, to Peter uh, really how he was to go on and go to Earth and meet Meredith and that Ego had to go on and no longer just become a living planet but to go on and want to try to become uh, life, like try to make uh, make up, of course, him his own like living being for him to be able to go on to other planets to go and meet with other life. So we go on and, of course, have Drax who's asking, it's like, well, hey, like, do you have a do you have a Johnson? Do you have a Wang? Do you have a? And so Peter is like, dude, I don't need to know that. And Drax is like, come on, like my uh, like my parents would go on and have this story about uh, them making me uh, and they would tell me this story every single winter solstice. Like it was a great story. And plus, also, I'm very concerned because this man is a planet. And how would he go and um, and make you with uh, your mother? Like, he would crush her. <laughs> and so... We go on and we have Ego that explains, yes, I have a wang and it's substantial. And Drax is like, okay, good, alright. So we know that story. And Peter's like, I don't think I want to know this. <laughs> so... We go on and of course we have... Uh, we have Ego that's explaining that eventually Meredith had gotten pregnant and that he had to forcefully come back to this planet um, because if uh, he is to be uh, too far away 
from this planet, eventually he will wither and die. So he had to go back to this planet. Um, plus also, he has to go on and go on to numerous planets, which we'll find out, for him to go and uh, just bang several women to go on and create a offspring, hoping that every single one of these offspring will go on and be able to uh, hold an infinity stone in their own hand and not die. Figuring that that would have to be Ego's offspring and this uh, character would have the power that Ego would have. Because we'll go on and we find out, we'll find out later that Ego had gone through a number of planets trying to find his perfect offspring. But every single time he was to go on and just get disappointed and turn around and just have Yondu continue to collect every single one of these kids just to more and more just feel like, God, there's never going to be that one uh, prime candidate that is to be able to have the same power as Ego will. So... We go on here and we have, of course, the uh, Elector Quadrant, which is to, of course, be Yandu's ship. So, and of course, we had seen this in Guardians of the Galaxy, and I don't think I ever actually explained that or said that or whatever. And I don't even know if that's the exact same ship that Yandu has in the very first film. I don't think I, like, really in-depth explained every single bit about that movie. Uh, but this might have been one thing that I forgot about. So, we go on, we have Yandu, uh, where his men are going and talking that this is all mutiny, that Taserface is going and taking command, and so we have guys like Tulk, um, who of course is to be shoved out of this airlock and is getting murdered, as well as anybody else who is to go alongside Yandu and work with him, and have them call Yandu their leader. They're getting airlocked out and getting killed instantly. Well, instantly is kind of a, 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 isn't the easiest word to say here. So really we have it work. Uh, uh, crawl, uh, Krellen. Kraglin? Kraglin? Kraglin. There we go. Kraglin, it seems that this guy is to go on and seem to kind of slip by and have no one go and accuse him of, uh, of course, uh, him needing to get killed, I guess. So we go on here and we, of course, have it where... Uh, We have Taserface who is going on and explaining his name to both Yandu and both Rocket. And Rocket, of course, is dying laughing because he's like, Oh my god, your name is Taserface? How is it that you think that the name could have been at all cool? Like, do you shoot, like, tasers out of your eyes? Or, like, what do you do that, like, has anything to do with, like, tasers? And the guy's like, well, it's metaphorical. And <laughs> Rocket's like, oh, my God. Like, how is, like, why out of all the names in the world, why would you choose that one? It makes no sense. So we go on and have Rocket, who's just more and more just making fun of Taserface as he's consistently saying his name and laughing every single time he says it. To where both Yandu and Rocket are to be shoved in this cell, and Rocket is still just like, "Hey, like, uh, like, tell your friends I said hi, lit Taser Face." <laughs> it's like, oh my god! So we go and we have them caging Baby Groot, and so they're going on and they're asking like, "Well, hey, what should we do with Baby Groot?" and so Taserface is saying that Baby Groot is too adorable to kill. So they need to just go on and send him to the tailor for him to just be a Ravager. Because that's all they can think for him to do. 
So we go on here and we of course have it again where uh, we're both Ego and both uh, Quill are going and, or Peter here, are going on and seeing a statue of Meredith, a big, massive statue. So eventually they go on here, and we have, of course, where uh, Ego is talking uh, and trying to get uh, Peter to use his imagination and to be able to use his power, because technically... Uh, Peter is immortal. So we go on, and of course we have Peter who is to be able to channel his power into making a ball, and all of a sudden we now have it where Ego and Peter are kind of tossing this ball back and forth, having this classic father and son moment. So we also have them talk about stars, uh... And so that kind of feels very reminiscent of, like, possible Starman or something like that. Uh, so. But we just have still that very nice, innocent movie part, whatever. So we go on and we find out that Yandu, I guess, used to be a, uh, a, a Kree battle slave uh, that was to eventually work his way up. To becoming a more prominent uh, Kree, uh, to the point of him eventually going on to become this Ravenger. So I'm like, okay, so we do find out that Yandu in his past was a Kree, which is kind of interesting. So so we go on. We have both Yandu and Rocket, where. We, of course, have these two characters where Yondu is kind of mentioning how Rocket is, like, a kind of professional at taking people off and stuff like that. So, we go on and we have Baby Groot that is to me now in Ravager clothes. And it seems that certain Ravagers, like, uh, uh, Taser Face and Wrecked here are going on and pouring beers over uh, Baby Groot, and he's going on and meeting uh, with both Rocket and Yondu uh, after everyone's gone to sleep. And so now we have, of course, where Yondu is desperately trying to explain to Groot about this prototype fin that Baby Groot, Baby Groot needs to go and find. So... We go on and have Baby Groot that's pulling a number of things that doesn't make sense for him to be pulling. Uh, weirdly like a, uh, a eye of somebody's um, or a toe of someone's or a desk or a thing of candy. Uh, everything that is to not be what exactly... Uh, the thing that Groot needs to grab. We of course at some point have Groot who's wanting, who's thinking that uh, this Ravenger symbol should be worn as a hat, but Groot hates hats. Goes on and talks about a whole thing of dialogue about hats. So we go on and we have uh, Kraglin who is to go on and just help group get this fin, chucks it at Yondu, and is to just say, like, hey, like, I didn't want to go and do mutiny, but a lot of people, a lot of my friends were getting killed, so I didn't want to get killed, so, like, I went and did my own thing. So, we go on and we have Yondu, who is going on, of course, with, uh, with Rocket here, and he's going through and whistling his way into killing all these Ravengers, killing them all off. So we go on and have him go into this, of course, uh, 
uh, security room where all these cameras are around for Yondu to go through and whistle his way into killing all these Ravengers. So we go on and of course we have the Elector Quadrant that is to have Yondu tell uh, Kraglin to go and separate the two ships because uh, they're going to escape where we're going to have one half of the ship that is to be uh, kind of exploding here with, of course, Taserface sending one last message to Aisha saying that the only thing that Taserface wants the credit for is the name of the person who is to uh, finish off, uh, of course, uh Yandu and the Guardians of the Galaxy, and when he says the name, Aisha laughs and is like, okay, sure. So we go on and we have this ship that separates. And so now they're going on and having this goofy thing where of course we have these characters who are making way too many jumps. Where you should only jump like 50 and they're they're jumping 700. And that that will go on to really warp their faces and really get some cool, funny looking, goofy things. Like the first time I saw this, I had a good chuckle about this because I was like, man, this is so goofy looking. So back at Egos, we, of course, have both uh, Peter and Gamora. And we have it to where we go on and have both Peter and Gamora who are consistently talking about both of them have this unspoken thing between both of one another where really towards finally the end of this movie we have them confirming that unspoken thing but really we have it to where we have peter who is to be the first one to talk uh really about this unspoken thing here where we go on we have peter comparing gamora to a show at some point how these two are uh two people that because peter of course is trying to get gamora to dance again and like it seems that it's still hard for her to want to dance with him be but like peter saying hey this is a really good song to dance to so we have Peter mentioning to Gamora how this is possibly going to be uh, one of these kinds of moments where finally both Peter and Gamora will get together. And it's like a show where you've kind of been waiting for these two these two people to get back together. And once they finally do, all of a sudden the ratings will heavily drop of the show and then eventually they'll get canceled. So... Because it's about the will they won't they thing. And then when they finally will, the show ends. So we, of course, go on and have Gamora, who is to just kind of change and not be that kind or not want to be that kind of thing. And then Peter is to change his tone and is to say, it's like, you know what? Like, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's just a show where this person is this way and this person is the other way. And... And that show doesn't really even exist. And so we go on and we have Peter who's going on and talking about Cheers. And Gamora's like, I don't know what Cheers is. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I don't get what Cheers is. Because, man, I desperately want just all the Guardians of the Galaxy just, be, just to be on Earth finally. And just be able to just binge watch a number of things. Or for them to get a Blu-ray and DVD collection of a number of things. Or for them to figure out how to be able to stream stuff. Because I want them to finally just be able to like see all of this stuff. And then, and then of course the Guardians of the, Go the Galaxy finally be uh, very pop cultured for Earth. And for them to know what, they're, what Peter is finally talking about for the love of God. So... We go on and we, of course, have it where uh, we're at one point. We have it where uh, Mantis and Drax are together 
and we have him going on and talking about uh, this pond or this water or whatever. And so it's reminding him about his, uh, about his, uh, I think his daughter or no, his son and how uh, he used to go and play uh, by this pond a lot and he starts crying. So we have, of course, Mantis who touches Drax and feels sad also. But then Mantis is thinking, you know what, I should probably go on and tell Drax the truth about what is really going on here. So we go on and we have Mantis who is interrupting uh, what's going on there. And so at some point we have Gamora who is to, of course, want to confront Mantis about like, hey, like, what were you going to tell Drax there? Like, before I was going to interrupt you, what were you going to say? So we go on and we have Gamora that is to, of course, separate here. And when she is to separate, as we go on and we had uh, Nebula before the ship was to uh, separate, of course, from the uh, electoral quadrant, we had uh, Nebula going and taking her share of the bounty and going off and getting one of their ships. And so uh, Craglin was going and telling Nebula, like, uh, hey, what are you going to do with your share? And Nebula is going on and mentioning all the stuff that she wants to go on and do um, to seek revenge. Because, of course, she is to have this story about every single time that her father was to go on and have this battle between Gamora. Gamora just wouldn't relent. Every single time Gamora had to go on and replace some part of her body with a robotic piece, so on and so forth. And so... We have it to where Nebula's only thing is to either go after her father or to go after her sister. And we, of course, have, like, Craglin, who's just like, well, I thought it was going to be just some nice little necklace or some little purse or some kind of some kind of, some kind of little nice thing. But, uh, I guess, whatever. <laughs> See you later. So... We go on and we have Nebula who takes this ship and then leaves. So we go on and now we have it where, of course, Gamora is just kind of sitting in this this part of this this place to all of a sudden have to now be running into this cave because Nebula is trying to shoot her down. So we go on and we have Nebula trying to crash this plane to get to Gamora and try and kill her and it just doesn't work. To the point of Nebula is now crashing her plane, and Gamora is to rip off this uh, one uh, piece of the ship that is to control this uh, gun part. And so Nebula is to fix this wire to where this gun is now firing every piece of uh, its ammunition at Nebula. So all of a sudden, the ship is to light on fire, and now Gamora has to turn around and save nebula but while saving nebula she also realizes that there's a number of skeletons bones and whatever from really just ego's offspring so now we forcefully go on and have both ego and quill that are going on and talking about that song that Quill's mother used to love the most. And so now we have here where Ego is breaking this song down and how Brandy could be a... Uh, like how this song could be perfect to understand both Ego and both Quill. That Brandy can go on and be Gamora for Peter 
and Ego could have been Meredith for him, as well as, like, uh, Peter could be also any number of things. So... But really, when it comes down to it, even though these things are, like, a fine girl, and what a good wife that they would be, still, every single time, there is always that calling of the sea that would have uh, either Ego or Peter go off to go and reach for that instead. Like, for Peter, it would probably be adventure that is calling him or just wanting to figure out who his father was instead of being so focused on getting Gamora, winning over Gamora, wooing Gamora, because uh, really all Peter was focused on is his adventure, which is to get Gamora more and more ticked off at him and is to never want that unspoken thing to really be spoken. So, to where we never really 100% like get that relationship and then it quickly just leaves us, so to speak. So, we go on and of course we have uh, really just Ego who is telling Peter, it's like, well, you know what? When really looking at it, we're immortals, and we can live forever. And so anything that you are to have right now, Peter, will eventually all just not matter. Because we end up finding out in this movie that uh, Ego's character is actually a celestial. Or a celestial. And so I'm like, oh my god, like celestials, just like Eternals. That whatever freaking movie that was. So we have it to where, like, Ego is just like that, uh, whatever goofy, big, massive thing that uh, Surtsey was talking to. Like, it's basically one and the same thing, because that thing was the size of a planet, this thing was a planet. So... We go on, and we now have it where Mantis is to, of course... Uh, go on and wake up Drax because Mantis wants to explain to Drax what's really going on. And so Drax is going on and saying, it's like, you know what? Like, I'm sorry, but like, I don't really like you that way. <laughs> like I want a girl with more meat on their bones. And we start to have it where Drax is starting to get sick with thinking the ability of being with Mantis physically. And he's starting to hurl. So we're desperately having Mantis go on and want to explain to Drax what's really going on. And Gamora kind of butts in and is like, hey, like, tell me what you were going to tell me before because I think I know what's going on here. So we go on and we start to explain that Ego had went through a number of different planets and he all found them all disappointing. That every single planet he had gone on to to have Yondu retrieve this kid eventually had it toward nobody had this power, but eventually uh, in every single planet, Ego would go on and leave the expansion upon every single planet that he went to. So we go on and we have it where Ego is a touch, of course, uh, Peter on the head to help him understand what the uh, what the universe really is or what eternity really is or just explain to him like what the plan of this all really is because we have it to of course where ego is to think that there is no way for him to have been able to pull off the expanse but now all of a sudden that Peter is here there's a possibility that um Ego could really pull this off. And so we go on here and we explain that eventually uh, Ego had uh, turned into a number of different things for a number of different uh, women so that we he can woo them to all have 
him go on and, of course, impregnate each one of their mothers. So we go on here and we, of course, uh, are to have the one scene where the Stan Lee character or the Stan Lee is to make a, the Stan Lee. Where Stanley makes a cameo with the Watchers, and because we still have uh, uh, Yondu and Rocket, they're kind of doing all these, uh, all these still these uh, these space travels. So we're seeing the Watcher and, and Stanley. So we're of course having both Yondu and Rocket who are going on and. We, of course, have the moment where Yondu is explaining who Rocket is to Rocket because Yondu is the exact same person. And the more and more that Yondu is explaining this, the more Rocket's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Because we have it to where Yondu is the exact same person. Having Rocket say, or having Yondu saying that no one is, like... Rocket thinks that no one is ever going to love him or whatever because they are still one and the same. So, and that's the reason why Yondu is wanting to go and help out Peter because it's the right thing to do, so on and so forth. So, we go on here and we, of course, have Back at Egos. There's so many freaking transitions here. We go on and we, of course, have Ego that's explaining to Peter that he sadly had to go on and put a tumor into, uh, of course, uh, Meredith's brain. So, because we have it where... Peter is consistently over and over and over again, always telling Ego about Meredith. And we have at one point where, of course, uh, of course, Ego was saying that he didn't want to go to a planet without Meredith in it. And Quill was just like, well, hey, like, I had to watch her die. Like, you weren't there when she died. I was there the whole way. And, of course, uh, the ego is like, well, I'm sorry. So, we go on, and after we have Peter realizing that we had ego who had killed his mother, we go on, we start having... Peter that starts blasting away at Ego. And so Ego is going on saying that he's like, well, hey, like, didn't I, like, make it so that I am the perfect dad for you? As basically all of a sudden, uh, Ego out of nowhere is to turn into David Hasselhoff and then is to turn back into Ego. And... We go on, we have Peter, who is to just start to fight off his own dad. Um, because we really have Peter realize how evil his dad really is. And how just uh, only Ego is thinking about Ego and nothing else. So, we, so we go on here and we have it where, of course... Uh, Yondu is making his way to Ego's planet and is to arrive uh, with the ship. And so we go on and we, of course, have uh, Star-Lord that's making his way onto Yondu's ship. And while that is happening, well, like we don't actually have the quadrant here. We just have some uh, some escape ship that Yandu is to have. So we go on here and we have Peter that makes it onto Yandu's ship. And 
we of course have it where Peter is mentioning about his power and how he just made a ball out of it. And Yandu's mentioning it's like, well, hey, kid, like, I didn't, I wasn't able to use this arrow with my head. Like, I used it with my heart. So we go on and we all of a sudden have this, uh, this ship that, of course, is, uh, Uh, um, I'm trying to think here because it's really late in the day so we go on we have the Guardians who are to make this Grandmaster plan about trying to kill off the Ego planet and they're going to use a bomb uh, to try to get into the center core of this planet and so we of course have them go on and while they're doing that, we, of course, have the uh, sovereigns that are going on and trying to intercept this, uh, try to intercept, uh, of course, the Ravengers and uh, the Guardians by trying to kill them off. But also, we have it to where it seems that the sovereigns are to also possibly want to take care of Ego also because it's they could probably see Ego's planet as a threat also, but it seems like they're wanting to focus more so on Guardians. So since the Guardians are realizing that these drone trips are coming after them, they're trying to fight them off. So we go on here and we, of course, have the drones that are trying to take out this one ship all blasting all at the same time. But then the drone, uh, but then the, of course, Yandu ship is going and blasting all over the place, uh, using, of course, Nebula as this generator. And Yandu is telling Nebula that this, that this is going to hurt. So she goes and blasts all over the place with the ship. And so it takes them out pretty well. So... We eventually go on and start to have all these characters eventually go on and get, all get dumped out of the ship at some point. They end up falling out of the ship and are to eventually all land on the ship and have to go and defend themselves because Ego is using its tentacles to start going on and uh, either grabbing on to certain people, crushing certain people with its power, or its ability, its whatever. And we have Mantis going and trying to touch the Ego planet to put it to sleep. So, with all of that jazz, uh, with everything that I've gone on and covered here, uh, we of course have both Star-Lord and Rocket who are to go on and make their way uh, to have Rocket go with Groot to detonate this bomb. And so we, of course, have it where Rocket is trying to explain to, to Groot what all to do. And we have Rocket who needs Groot to re-explain what all he had just said. So every single time Groot is pointing at the wrong button to hit, I'm like, out of both of those buttons, it seems like one of the buttons is to be the most mangled up or the most cracked you think Rocket would probably tell Groot, whichever button is not cracked, that's the one you don't hit. So, now we have the whole scene where we, of course, have Rocket go on and ask about, uh, mass, bleh, ask Peter about the whole tape thing. Does anybody have tape? So, we now have the whole scene where Peter is running around, supposedly, and asking a number of different people if they all have tape. And at some point, we of course have Drax who says he has scotch tape. But then he doesn't really have any tape. So we go on and we have Peter who's telling Rocket that nobody has tape. And Rocket is saying, of course, like, well, hey, did you ask Nebula? And Peter is like, well, really? Like, Yondu is right next to Nebula. And Nebula said, no, they don't have tape. So, 
So eventually Groot just goes and takes this bomb and runs off and Rocket's like, oh my god, we're going to die soon. So we, so we go on and we of course have it where we have Peter who gets back into Yondu's ship and tries to take out all of these uh, sovereigns just for them to go on and, of course, destroy the uh, the Ravager like ship that they were in to just have, of course, both uh, Star Lord and Yandu that are kind of just falling to this ground, and we now have the Mary Poppins scene where it's like. Hey guys, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> Cause we have it where, of course, Star Lord is saying that uh, Yandu looks like Mary Poppins, and we have Yandu that's asking Star Lord. It's like, well, is he cool? And Star Lord is like, yeah, he's cool. So I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. So we of course now have. Uh, of course, Ego that is starting to take down any people that I didn't mention before who had gotten taken down. So we have a number of people who fall to their deaths at some point to be uh, to be saved. Nebula goes on and saves Gamora and is like, hey, don't don't rub it in. Don't don't even mention it that I saved your life. So we have them going on and riding a rock at some point to just get back to where everyone else is. So we have eventually Yandu who is desperately trying with his uh with his uh arrow to try and take down uh of course uh Ego, but that isn't working. We of course have Rocket who tries to use his bombs and that doesn't work with his weird yellow shield that I've never seen him use before, but now he's using here. So we go on, we have everybody trying to use stuff, and it all fails. So now, Peter is, of course, being stabbed in the chest again, almost being uh, forced to be a battery for a thousand years, like his father is to tell him that he wants him to be before. So we go on, we have Yandu, who's telling Peter yet again that he didn't use his head, he used his heart. So... Peter, of course, is to have in the background Fleetwood Mac's change song being played here because Peter is to now go on and use his powers to attack his own father because now it seems that both Peter and Ego are at an even playing field because both of them are immortals, so they're both going to fight one another. So we, of course, go on and further and further have it where um uh where now uh ego is to become a much larger version of himself and peter is to become pac-man and they are to basically go and and smash into one another and just continue to go on and just fight one another until uh i guess one another eventually gets exhausted we also had it to where Ego was to knock out Mantis, which is to have at one point where Yandu is calling the Quadrant to land uh, so that way Drax and Mantis can go on to try to make it to that ship. But we have Drax who almost uh, is to be suffocated under this uh, part of land, but eventually he gets onto the Quadrant and is to help... Uh, Craglin go on and um, man this ship. So, as well as we also have it where Drax was forcibly wearing this arrow rig to have him scream in pain because of his sensitive nipples. So, <coughs> so, excuse me here. So, we go on and now we have it where, of course, uh, all the Guardians are to make their way onto the Quadrant ship. And so now, 
Yondu is going to have to go after Peter as all the other Guardians are making it onto the Quadrant ship. And so we go on and we have Rocket who is telling Yondu here that he is to only have uh, two different pieces. He is to have one last uh, jetpack and one last spacesuit. So I guess the spacesuit, the spacesuit was the shield generated thing that we were to see Drax um, having on. I would have thought that that would have had a much more technical name, but I guess not. So we also had it, or um, yeah, I think that was it. So we go on here and we have it where, of course, uh, Yandu is saying it's like, well, okay, like, uh, like I'll go on and I'll I'll get Peter and like you guys go off and so we of course have it where Rocket is to say to Yandu, it's like, well, hey, welcome to the Guardians of the freaking Galaxy, and because that's what Groot said, but he didn't say freaking. So we go on and we have both Rocket and Groot making his way off, and Rocket is telling Groot that he needs to like learn his p's and q's and have more manners so we go on here and we of course have it where peter and ego are fighting it out and so now we of course have uh ego that tells peter it's like well hey if you let this planet die you'll be uh you'll be normal again you'll be mortal again and peter's like well what's wrong with that so the bomb is to blow uh ego is to now of course lose his planet and we just have ego who is just disintegrating before uh peter peter's very eyes because of course the uh the brain or the heart of this thing is now dead so we now go have Yondu go on and scramble to find Peter. It is to now go and have them both zip off to, of course, have Peter get the spacesuit as Yondu is to get the arrow rig. And Yondu is flying off um, to, of course, have the, uh, the quadrant go and try and get to uh, Peter. Because y- by the time they get to uh, Yandu, he'll already be dead. So, we of course have Gamora who wants to go after Quill. And Rocket is to shock her and the Quadrant is to take off. And Drax is consistently asking Rocket like, hey, where's Quill? Where's Quill? Where's, where's, where's Quill? When is Quill? Why is Quill? where is quill so we go on and we have it where of course uh yondu is to die and peter is to watch as yondu is to die so we of course have yondu that's telling peter it's like hey uh ego may have been your daddy but he wasn't the one that raised you (laughs) and so we really have it here where Yondu is to have this moment to tell Peter, it's like, hey, like, I was really your dad. Um, and I loved you like a dad would. And so we go on and we have that nice, sweet, tender moment, which, of course, would get a lot of people t- crying and, and teary-eyed and whatever, because it's a very emotional part of this film. So... We then transition on here and, of course, have, uh, of course, Yondu's funeral where we have them kind of uh, send his body off and Peter is to go on and say how Yondu was just like Knight Rider and how Yondu went on and did a number of ventures, uh, may not have had a talking car, but it seemed he had something else and so on and so forth he kept making so many comparisons to yandu to not writer to night writer and so on and so forth and so they just sent him off so 
we go on we have rocket or yeah i think rocket or craglin who was to go on and send a message about what yondu had done and i guess because of what he had done the ravengers had all decided that it's like well hey like i don't care about the past we're gonna like knowing what he had done now we're gonna go on and we're gonna like uh, we're going to go and give him a Ravenger's funeral because he saved all of us. So, we have Ogard. We have, uh, of course, uh, Martin X. We have uh, Charlie27, uh, who, of course, is Ving Rames. We have Alberta Ogart, uh, which is to uh, technically be a girl that's on another ship that... Uh, we have an old, we have a whole end credit scene that is to combine a number of these characters and to say that they are to all get together and do some future task altogether. And then it's been a long time since they've all combined forces. Um, Miley Cyrus is to be a character called Mainframe. Um, and I have no clue what that actually is. But she's there somewhere. So we go on and we have this Ravager's funeral. And so luckily I've covered all that stuff so I can get that all out of the way. Thank goodness. So we go on and so now we have it where, of course, uh, there is to now be a... Uh, a number of end credit scenes. I guess there is to be supposedly four. So. Because really we have it to where uh, Yondu's funeral is to be the, of course, last thing. Uh, as well as Craglin going and giving Peter this Zune that is to have 300 songs as he's listening to the father and son song. And that could also get a lot of people emotional. And we also have it to where Peter is to give Craglin this arrow that was to, of course, be Yandu's arrow that Rocket is to reconstruct. So now I think that's about it. Uh, we, had, we had also Gamora confessing to Peter that it's just the unspoken thing between the both of them. And so, yeah, like hopefully that covers everything. That covers this whole movie because now we're just going to get an end of credits and then I can finally call this a day and under two hours. Oh my God. Whoopee. Yeah, that's awful. Like, why did I take so long to have to explain this film? Because there's so much to explain. Um, I don't think I talked much about the sovereign ships, but like they had their drones all come in and they of course got wiped out. And like the only thing that is really left for them to do is to unleash Warlock somewhere in the distant future because they didn't release him in Endgame. So, yeah, like maybe they'll go on and release him uh, at some point. So, we go on and we have the end credit scenes. Aisha is to go on and uh, tell us that she is going to release Adam Warlock at some point. Hopefully in Volume 3, because this thing has been marinating for a freaking long A time. Uh, we also have Groot, who of course is to eventually be maturing into a much more teenage-seeming Groot. And so Peter is getting annoyed that Peter's uh, or Groot's gr uh, vines are all over the place. And that he's just playing games all day. And we have it where Peter is to finally understand why Yandu was the way he was when uh, Peter had gotten much older, uh, when he first had gotten him. We also have it to where Kragland is going and testing the fin uh, and is trying to use this arrow and is all of a sudden stabbing Drax in the shoulder area. Uh, with his arrow and then Kraglin is to go on and walk off realizing that he's never going to perfectly perfect this arrow like Yandua did. But I'm sure he's going to have plenty of X amount of time to have practiced this by now uh, when he goes on to Volume 3. And we also have it where, of course, 
Uh, we have another cameo via uh, Stan Lee going on and mentioning uh, about all of his other cameos and all of his connections and all of his whatever, which I think by then that is to technically be four, which, yeah, that's it. So that, of course, is to be wrapping up this movie. If there's anything at the end of the day that I did not say about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I apologize, but I otherwise think it's freaking time for me to just get the heck out of here because I have been talking for far too long about this film. So with that said, I think I'm going to get out of here. Uh, I don't ever actually remember actually seeing the music video that had any tie with this movie with David Hasselhoff and whatever that is. Uh, I don't think I did. I don't think I watched that one. So if I were to have had to have seen that one, I didn't. Uh, maybe I'll review that at some point. <laughs> I doubt it. Um, but yeah, I think with that, I'm going to just get out of here. Thank you for watching this review. Thank you for going through any MCU or DCEU thing or just any normal other review that isn't a superhero film if you all of a sudden just stumbled upon this one and you watched it for whatever reason. Thank you for that because at the end of the day, uh, these superhero films are not the easiest to do, hence why I would have to go on and consistently have to go down and look at something to make sure I'm saying something right, to make sure that I'm going on and perfectly doing this review the best of my knowledge. And hopefully I didn't forget anything or forget any hugely funny moments, which I'm sure those are the usual ones that slipped my mind when eventually I go on and do a review where it's like, oh my god, I forgot about the biggest joke of this film. I forgot about the biggest thing of this thing uh, because those are bound to happen. Um, so with that said, I think I'm just going to get out of here. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.